Please subscribe, like and share our videos. Exclusive content brought to you here on Latif Yahya's channel only. Chapter 2 Paradise in Hell I've known Uday for years. We were in the same class at Baghdad High School for Boys. Uday, whose father, Saddam, was vice president of Iraq at the time, is only four days younger than me. He was born on the 18th June 1964 and I was born on the 14th. In my childhood, I didn't know much about the politician's son. Why would I? I had a happy, carefree upbringing in my parents' house. We lived in a large, imposing property in one of the best residential areas in Baghdad, the al Adamiya district. My parents were wealthy. My father, Yahya al Salihi, owned a factory and had three successful shops in Baghdad that sold electrical goods and cookers. He also had another business dealing in marble and other natural stone. We were upper class but, when I was at grammar school, I wasn't as aware of that status as I was later on. I only knew I was the eldest son and the pride and joy of my mother, Bahar al-Majadi. We were all devout Muslims. We could afford anything we wanted and, just like my brothers Yodi, Robi and Omid and my sisters Galala and Juan, we enjoyed the best of everything. We all innocently grew up in paradise as Baghdad was still paradise in those days. I liked going to school and my father worked with me and on me. No son could ask for a better father. He taught me, supported me and encouraged my talents. I think my father loved me more than his other children but that might have been just my impression because I was his first son. In the summer holidays, he took me to his shops and showed me how to negotiate sales. I remember his advice never sell, let the customer buy. He always wanted me to follow his example and become a successful businessman. I tried my best not to disappoint him. My six years in primary school couldn't have gone better. I was always top of my class and my teacher, Madame Fazia, told my father, your son is very gifted, he will make a mark. In my early years, I spent my spare time in the workshop area of the shops watching as electrical goods were dismantled, repaired and put back together again. How tape recorders, televisions, video recorders worked, I found utterly fascinating. My young, inquisitive mind was desperate to learn. I wanted to know everything about everything. I also had a talent for drawing and painting. I painted big, kitschily realistic works of art notable for vivid, bright colors. Mosques, houses, trees, the Tigris River, portraits of my teacher and family were my subject matter and models. I don't know why but I found it easy to draw scenes and people from memory. Baghdad High School for Boys was the best school in Iraq and still is today. It was exclusively for the offspring from rich families, the sons of politicians, military leaders and powerful people. These were Iraq's elite and any boy who wasn't from a wealthy family would only be admitted if he had incredibly high marks and recommendations from primary school teachers or was able to demonstrate exceptional talents worthy of encouragement. It was the establishment where Iraq's urbane youngsters were educated. The privileged few who would grow up to give the leading nation within the Arab camp an even more prominent place in the world. The school was large and impressive. It consisted of one main building, two smaller side buildings and was spread over an area of roughly one square kilometer. Beneath it was a complex series of bunkers. The Americans had built them to withstand a nuclear attack. There were atom bomb resistant rooms, endless passages with bowling alleys, table tennis tables and shelters packed with food supplies. The school was both an educational establishment and a military installation. It wasn't just as pupils who were carefully vetted before they could attend the school, all the professors were as well. Saddam personally ensured that only the best teachers were appointed. We were Iraq's future, the young tip of a system which ensured the privileged enjoyed every possible advantage and those who were not so well off had no chance of rising to the top. It was a complete inversion of socialism, education on an extreme capitalist model. The pupils were cordoned off, nurtured and protected. Ordinary Iraqis, the plebs, were unable to distract us from the high aims of our education. Because the sons of the most important men in Iraq attended the school, 
It was under continual surveillance by the secret service organization Jahaz al Amen al Qas. This was practically sacred as it was the highest of Iraq's four secret services. School gardeners, janitors, domestic staff were all highly trained members of it. All around the school, which was in the Al Adamiya district not far from my family home, there were control posts with guards who were always observing and checking those approaching the school. It was impossible for outsiders to even walk on the school grounds. We were educated in the equivalent of a locked safety deposit box securing the future of Iraq's young hopefuls. Those foolish enough to try and evade the strict regulations were arrested. The same fate also befell anyone who tried to introduce people who weren't from the institution. The hapless friend would be seized and the pupil who had tried to smuggle him in immediately expelled in disgrace. We were constantly guarded and checked, prisoners of a school system that had only two objectives, to give young men the best education whilst, at the same time, to bring them up from earliest childhood to be loyal party supporters. We weren't encouraged to have a will of our own, far from it. What was important was the rules of Saddam's society were followed 1000%. A special teacher's commission had to ensure all the professors were ideologically pure and held leading roles within the Ba'ath party. This was overseen by our headmaster Fasa, a huge man who looked cruel and frightening, and was. He must have weighed 16 stone and was about 45 years old. First impression of him was his big head and thick set, muscular build. Not surprisingly, Fasa had been a boxer and Iraq's national champion. Everyone suffered under him. He was as brutal as a guard dog, but all powerful so both pupils and teachers had to tolerate this evil man whose personality matched his looks. He was obviously a good Ba'ath party soldier and had been appointed by Saddam in appreciation. The professors passed the pressure Fasa exerted on them directly onto the pupils. From the age of 12, we all had to join the Ba'ath party. There was no exceptions. The initial stage of party membership was called Majid. The first class was difficult for me because everything was new and strange but I studied hard as I wanted to be the best. I knew the party was more important than anything. We learned how the hierarchy was constructed, what its basic features, objectives, programs and structures were. The golden rule was the Ba'ath party is the highest thing of all and, without the party, you are nothing. The most important book was therefore the party's doctrine, namely the central report of the Ninth National Conference of the Ba'ath Party. This spelled out the party's history from its formation to the present day in monotonous detail. Everyone in Iraq had to know this book off by heart every line, every word. Unbelievably, the party program was even more important than the Quran. I thought it completely normal at the time. I was only 12 years old and didn't know any difference. As everyone had to do it, I didn't see it as indoctrination when we were drilled for two hours every week at party meetings. It was up to our teachers to ensure we all fulfilled our party duties and anyone who missed them was given extra homework. If he didn't do it or failed to attend again, the miscreant would be expelled from the school. The vast majority devoted ourselves to the programs as if they were the holiest of holies, which they were. The first step onto the Ba'ath party ladder is to become a sympathizer. From ordinary sympathizer you become an active sympathizer, then a pioneer and finally an active member. Only if you are an active member can you be considered to become a company leader, division leader and then a leading member at a communal and trans-regional level. I didn't feel my time spent on party work was particularly irksome as it applied to all Iraqis. I knew my school was a golden opportunity to befriend the sons of both party leaders. I was spoiled for choice. Ali Mohammed Saleh's father was one of the most important men in Iraq. Waymeed al Sadun's father was an officer in Al Qas. Usama Cotton was from the family of the head of the Iraqi Central Bank. But my best friend was Syed Michel Aflak. His father was the man who actually introduced the Arab Socialist Ba'ath Party into Iraq. He promoted it and built it into the dominant political machine it had become. He was Saddam's most powerful political advisor. Syed was a friendly boy who had had a perfect upbringing. It was obvious to me he was a breed apart from the other pupils. He had an upright, dignified posture, an elegant walk, immaculate manners and a perfect way of speaking and behaving. Though only 14, he was like most other men at 30. I thought it wise to become friendly with him and worked determinedly to do so. 
I did this slowly and cautiously as I didn't want to appear so keen that other boys would notice. We often smiled at each other in class and at break times I tried to start conversations with him. One Monday in November 1978, following a particularly grueling lesson, he suggested to me that we meet up one evening at the Al Alwiya Club. The Al Alwiya Club? I couldn't believe what I'd heard. It was a dream place as far as I was concerned that could have been on a different planet. Actually, the Al Alwiya Club was situated behind the Sheridan Hotel and epitomized the exclusive, wealthy, elegant side of Baghdad. At this time, Iraq was still the darling of the West. Foreign entrepreneurs invested and traded with billions of dollars changing hands. There was barely a large Western conglomerate that didn't have a finger in the Iraq pie. International hotels were springing up all over Baghdad which was the epicenter of business and indulgence. It attracted businessmen, arms traders, chancers and even pleasure seekers from our Arab brother neighbors because Baghdad offered everything a Western capital city did, nightclubs, bars serving alcohol and women serving themselves. Beautiful women of all nationalities flocked to cash in on the modern-day oil equivalent of the Klondike Gold Rush and they were welcomed with open wallets. Cash was thrown around by everyone as if it was just colored toilet paper. I'd heard it said that membership of the Al Alwiya Club was so expensive that I thought it incredible that anyone could afford to join. Between $2,000 to $3,000 per month. When Syed collected me one Friday morning, I wanted to ask Syed if this was true but thought he would think less of me if I did. Although he was only 14, Syed drove his own Mercedes. In Iraq, there were no prohibitions and rules on such matters. Children from wealthy and powerful families had complete freedom to do what they liked. No policeman would dare to challenge them if he wanted to stay a policeman. This absurd system was positively futile and the ruling class were a law unto themselves. I'd put on my best suit. My best wasn't as good as Syed's though. He was dressed straight off the cover of a men's fashion magazine attired a pale Armani linen suit, an Yves Saint Laurent silk tie and Gucci shoes. He also must have doused himself with a whole bottle of an expensive cologne. The club entrance was impressive. A big gate and two guards checking everyone who drove through. Syed had a sticker on his windscreen indicating he was a member. Through the gate was the car park with row upon row of prestigious cars. Not a single one was a lesser mark than a Mercedes. They were all as clean as if they'd been driven here straight from the car showroom, the polished chrome of their bumpers glistening in the sun. More security men guarded the doorway into the club. Syed casually flashed his membership card which I saw had his name and photograph on it. To my alarm, I was asked for my membership card. But Syed solved my dilemma in his casual but authoritative manner that was all his own. He gently took my arm and guided me into the club telling the security men that I was his friend. That friendship was sufficient to guarantee my entry. The club surpassed my expectations. And, I expect, surpassed most clubs of its kind in the West. There were restaurants, huge halls full of the latest computer games, video rooms, billiard tables. Everything I could imagine. Party rooms as vast as St. Peter's Square in Rome or St. Stephen's Square in Vienna. Syed told me these party rooms could be hired for weddings and birthday parties when they would be transformed with appropriate decorations. The less wealthy would hire rooms in the Hotel Al Rashid, the Sheridan or the Almansor. But anyone who was someone in Baghdad society came here. There were magnificent terrace swimming pools and also a polo pitch, a cricket pitch and two basketball courts. Syed seemed to know almost all the young men in the club. Not wanting to cramp his style, I stayed in the background but listened with interest as he talked to friends of his father about the latest cars. Then the conversation turned to the absolute non plus ultra of Iraqi society, the Al Said Club. To my surprise, I heard the Al Said Club was even more palatial than the Al Alwiya. It was also more exclusive as only members of Saddam Hussein's family the families of his advisors and close friends of the president as well as the families of all his ministers, have access. Even the normally calm Syed got excited as he remembered the first time he accompanied his father to the Al-Sayed club. It's paradise, it's really paradise, he enthused to an attentive gathering. I stood listening to him as if he was a prophet. Al said isn't Sunset Boulevard or Ocean Drive in Miami Beach, it's much better than that, he continued, 
casually holding his glass of gin and tonic with ice and lemon. The lawn is green but not a normal green, he continued as our jaws dropped. That lawn would make you think of the best golf courses in England. Dark, thick juicy grass. Life, the sun, the stars, the universe. Al Saeed is all of that. As he spoke, Syed made gestures like those given by Bing Crosby when he seeks the favors of Grace Kelly in high society. And then the swimming pools. The pools are all decorated with mosaics and the water is deep sapphire blue, really great. The conversation had turned into a monologue delivered by Syed to an admiring audience. No one dared interrupt, we all wanted to hear more. Only ministers go there, security know every identity card, every name, every detail. After a sip of his drink, he launched into a story that sounded totally incredible. Once a Mercedes 500 cell drove up. At first, I couldn't see a driver but there must have been one as even a Mercedes doesn't drive on its own. Then the driver got out. We all waited for Syed to complete his story. He was a 12-year-old boy in a white smoking jacket. He had a gun in his belt and was protected by four bodyguards. He was a minister's son. I could have listened to Syed forever which was just as well as he seemed capable of talking forever. If you cause the slightest problem in this club, they throw you out immediately. Regardless of who your father is. Regardless of what influence your family has. If you cause the slightest problem, your father will never see your face again because they'll finish you off. They'll really finish you off. As Syed took another sip of his drink, another boy asked a logical but ill-advised question, what about girls? Syed's normally calm, pleasant face transformed into rage. He dramatically shook his head and hissed with scorn. What sort of an idiot are you? They're totally taboo. If they smile at you, you look away. Look at the ground, the sky. Do something, anything. Walk faster, whistle, whatever but for God's sake don't talk to them. The girls are untouchable, unattainable, from a different world. Even to me. As the questioner blushed with embarrassment, Syed took a deep breath before offering more advice like a survival trainer briefing raw recruits. Enjoy yourself. Play billiards or basketball but hands off those girls. They're under constant surveillance and if you see them and talk to them, you'll be under surveillance too. That means you'll be in the files of the Secret Service and those files will swat you sooner or later. You'll lose your future, your hopes, your life. You'll lose everything. The evil spirits will never let you go, especially if the girl is one of Uday's girlfriends. After my visit to the Al Alwiya club, I was impressed, confused and excited all at once. The club facilities, Syed's stories, the magnificent lunch. I felt important and was certain that I could only achieve something in the country if I joined. When Syed gave me a lift home, I asked him to drop me off in an adjacent road to the one I lived in. I didn't want him to park in front of my family house because although it was imposing and larger than most, I suddenly felt inferior and small. As I got out, Syed called to me, Latif I'd be happy if you become a member as well. He wasn't as happy as I was but my joy was short-lived as I knew I could never afford to join. However, two days later, I was the newest and proudest member of the Al Alwiya club. Syed had got my membership fee waived. I never asked how but no doubt his father had something to do with it. Syed had accepted me as a friend and from then on we spent all our free time at the club. One Friday afternoon, we were playing basketball when we heard gunfire. Salvos from a machine gun. The shots came from a terrace swimming pool. We sprinted over to it and saw several boys wearing dark brown jalabas, traditional costume. One was standing by the cash desk pointing a machine gun in one hand and brandishing a till receipt in the other. Backing him up were a group of older boys. Men from the club argued with the younger boy who shouted and fired more bursts into the air. I asked a waiter who the boy with the machine gun was. He whispered, Uday Saddam and hurried away. So that's him, the president's notorious son, I thought to myself. Although I could only see his side profile, I noticed that we looked decidedly similar. His eyes, his nose, his hair. He definitely looked like me. 
I kept quiet about what had happened and didn't mention it to my father or brothers. I also had the good sense not to ask anyone why Uday had fired his gun. I remembered Syed's advice on our first day at the club, if you notice something, look away, ignore everything, look uninterested. Never try to come into contact with them or find out anything about them because they are more powerful than you and your parents. They are Iraq. A year later, in 1979, in the middle of the school year, our teacher announced the imminent arrival of a new pupil. The young gentleman, he said, comes from Almansur High School and is going to be your new classmate. The young gentleman was machine gun toting Uday Saddam Hussein. His father had chosen our class for his son because we were the best in our year. All of us had excellent grades and there weren't any problems with our political training. His first day at school was like a scene from a bad film. The door flew open and Uday, who was 15 years old, as we all were, strode arrogantly in with his head held high. No greeting or smile. Two well-built bodyguards took position by the door, two more at the other end of the classroom. A fifth stayed beside Udi at all times and even carried his school books. His presence sparked great excitement. We all lost our concentration and it was too much for the teacher as well. Uday's grand entrance was repeated every day. First came the bodyguards, then Uday, usually wearing jeans and a shirt which made him look like a cowboy. His hair was longer than ours and his tousled mop was reminiscent of Jimi Hendrix. After a few weeks, we became used to Uday's daily appearance. There was nothing friendly about him, nothing normal, nothing ordinary and, from the first day, I found him repulsive. He showed no respect to any of the teachers or anyone else who tried to tell him anything. He didn't care about the schoolwork or exams. In fact, he didn't care, full stop. There were 23 other boys in the class all trying their best to be successful but that seemed to make Uday worse. If a teacher asked Uday to come to the blackboard, Uday threw chalk at him, ordered him to change the subject or told him to leave him in peace. Uday arrived whenever he wanted, left whenever he wanted and did whatever he wanted. Despite this, he was always top of the class. Uday broke all the rules. He drove his Porsche at speed into the school playground and deliberately parked it on the basketball court so no one could play. He even broke the strictest rule of all, girls. One day, he brought his girlfriend into class. Solwa Ahmad al Sapti was a beautiful young girl with long black hair, light skin and green eyes. She wore stylish, designer clothes. No one said anything but the silence was embarrassing in itself. Uday sat down in his place and Salwa sat next to him. She looked decidedly uneasy as if Uday had forced her to accompany him. When our professor arrived, you could hear a pin drop. We all waited anxiously for his reaction. The professor went up to Uday. Would there be a shouting match? Would the bodyguards intervene? Nothing so dramatic. He courteously bowed to Uday and said in a half whisper, Mr. Uday, this won't do. We sensed the professor's inner anger at being put in such a humiliating situation and admired his dignified way of dealing with it. Uday reveled in the moment and in being the center of attention. He was clearly used to confrontation. Without the slightest respect, he said dismissively, you do your job and I'll do mine. Get on with the class. There was the briefest glare between the two. Then Uday lounged back in his chair and toyed with his gold fountain pen. He laughed and held the hand of his girlfriend who sat cowering beside him. Uday knew the professor had no power to do anything and the professor knew it too. He swallowed his pride and began his lecture as if nothing had happened. But it had. After half an hour, Uday got up, took his uneasily smiling girlfriend by the arm and led her out of the classroom. We couldn't believe his rudeness. It was an unexpected lesson to us all and, for the first time, I understood how much power Uday had. He was the son of Saddam Hussein who was by now president of the Republic of Iraq. The teacher who had dared to reprimand Uday over bringing his girlfriend to an all-boys school didn't appear at school the next day. Or any other? He was never seen again. None of us knew what happened to him, except, of course, Uday. The school had a room designated for art classes. We had two hours a week there and they were my favorite lessons as drawing was my passion. My first pictures were drawings from nature. 
I also drew scenes from Kurdistan. During the summer holidays, I had gone on a trip there with my father in his white Volvo. We'd visited Sersensk and Sheikh Lawa. My grandparents came from this beautiful region in the north of Iraq. My grandfather left Kurdistan, before my father was born, to set up a shop in Baghdad. My family still had many relations in northern Iraq and I enjoyed meeting them and exploring the scenic countryside which inspired many of my large colorful paintings. The school art teacher was so enthusiastic about all his pupils' works of art that he had them displayed in a room that became our school gallery. The exhibition was an outstanding success. My paintings attracted much praise and I was awarded a prize for the best picture. It was one of my landscapes of Kurdistan. All my friends congratulated me. To my surprise, even Uday did but, Uday being Uday, he had an ulterior motive. He put his arms round me, slapped me on the back and said, I want you to paint a picture for me. A portrait of my father, your president. I want to give it to him. This was in 1980. Saddam Hussein had formally accepted the office of head of state and government on 16 May 1979. Never one to interplay his many talents, he also became general secretary of the Ba'ath Party and general commander of the armed forces. His predecessor was President Ahmed Hassan al Becker, who had died of a sudden heart attack. Or that was the official version. The unofficial version, whispered in private, was that Saddam had had him poisoned. Al Becker's wife and eldest child were also rumored to have been murdered. They had died shortly before in a tragic car accident when a truck had rammed into their limousine. Whatever the truth, it's undeniable that Saddam had planned to succeed Al Becker and had been the real president of Iraq, in all but official title, for many years. He was regularly on television and the Iraqi population saw him as their savior, the direct descendant of a prophet. A god who could make Iraq great and powerful a new Babylon. Saddam never missed an opportunity to hammer home his belief that Iraq was a modern incarnation of the new Babylonian empire of antiquity. Although our new president had many people executed, putschists as my father called them, they departed from this world largely unnoticed. What was of more interest was that Saddam declared war on illiteracy in my country and gave women all the rights which Islam deprives them of in many other Arab countries. He also increased oil production and used the profits to directly benefit us, the people from whose country the oil gushed. That's why, when Uday asked, or ordered, me to paint his father, I considered it an honor. I remembered the joyful day Saddam came to power. The whole of Iraq celebrated, including me. With all my friends, I ran through the streets shouting Saddam. Saddam. And millions shouted with me. Strangers hugged each other. All Iraqis seemed to be ecstatically happy. Even my father, who was normally rather reserved, was completely over the moon. Now everything will be better and Iraq will be the leading Arab nation. That was his prediction. We were all delusional but no one realized on that day of mass celebration. And now the son of this great man was going to present my portrait to him. What an honor for a schoolboy. I knew Saddam had dozens of resident portrait painters. Every artist in Iraq was keen to be included in the unbounded personality cult Saddam had inspired. All over Iraq, on every street corner, on every barracks, on every public building, huge, kitsch pictures of Saddam paid homage to the great man. Saddam as a soldier? Saddam as a peasant? Saddam as our president? Saddam as a strong and powerful leader? Saddam everywhere? That's why I was surprised and delighted Uday wanted to bestow this unexpected honor on me. But I played it down a bit. Okay, I said, I'll do it. From his Porsche, which was in its usual parking space in the playground, Uday produced some photographs of his father. Not that I needed a reference of the man I couldn't help but see every day. I'll need four days, I said. Uday just nodded. It was finished three days later and was a very good likeness, even if I do say so myself. I took it into school, presented it to Uday after class and waited nervously for his reaction. I needn't have worried. He beamed his approval. Thimply perfect, thimply perfect, he lisped. He had slightly protruding buck teeth which gave him a slight speech impediment. Not that anyone dare mention it. I waited anxiously for the verdict on my work of art. A few days later, I received news. 
Uday had contacted Saleh al Juburi, a party boss, and ordered him to promote me to the next stage of the party ranks. I was elevated from the Majid stage up to the Nasir rank. That wasn't my only reward though the other was less welcome. From then on, Uday sought me out, spoke to me every day, wanted to meet me. He even said that if there was anything I ever wanted, he would make sure I got it. But I remembered the warnings and, though sociable to him, I certainly didn't go out of my way to build on our new. Found friendship. There was another reason for this. I found my facial similarity to him so unpleasant that, quite against my usual docile nature, I reacted angrily every time my classmates taunted me about it. Look, here comes Uday, they mocked. I knew deep down they were envious of my friendship with him but it still riled me. My parents were also concerned about me associating with him because by now his escapades were becoming a topic of whispered conversations in Baghdad society. Be friendly, my father advised me, but keep your distance. Quite difficult when I sat a few seats away from him in class. After our final exams, I applied to the technical university as I had always wanted to be an engineer right from my early days sat in father's workshops. But, when I discovered Uday had also applied and would be on the same course, I withdrew my application and chose law instead. My engineering aspirations weren't so strong that I was prepared to tolerate more years of his obnoxious company. Thankfully, my decision meant I lost touch with Uday. I thought doubtless he had quickly forgotten about me for which I was extremely thankful and relieved. I successfully completed my legal studies in 1986. Follow for the next chapter.